Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Bull. Thanks for being with us. We are your source for market intelligence, forecasts, and strategies. Thanks for joining us on one of the radio stations around the country, or maybe you're on iTunes or YouTube or the show website, commercialrealestateshow.com. Thank you for being with us. We have an incredible show for you today. We're going to talk about something that's very interesting to people all around the country. That's adaptive reuse. You, know, you think about it today, there's a lot of development, there's a lot of mixed-use development that's involving adaptive reuse. Um, there's a lot of advantages and some disadvantages to adaptive reuse. So we're going to look at it from all sides, from an architect's view, from a developer's view, uh, from an investor, uh, a tenant. Uh, maybe you want to buy or lease an adaptive reuse, reuse project. You want to know all the ins and outs. We're going to cover that today. And please welcome my first guest. It's Bruce McAvoy. He's an architect with Perkins Will. Now, Perkins Will was founded in 1935, and they have 24 offices all around the world, and they've been real active with adaptive use, reuse projects. And Bruce, thanks for joining us here in Studio One. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here again. Well, we appreciate it. And uh, first of all, you know, why adaptive reuse? I mean, it's easier, there's more knowns in just building a new structure, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. why not get into the potential issues of adaptive reuse? Well, I think, um, you know, there's, it's definitely easier at times, but there's also an incredible building stock out there um, that's kind of at either at end of its life or maybe some of these buildings are just tired, they've been kind of left to history, they're forgotten. Um, and it's a great way to jump into a new project sometimes, given um, the existing bones of that building. Um, there's also just a really interesting part uh, and a sense of history and patina to these buildings. Um, all across America, we have these old industrial corridors, and it seems like more and more there's discussion about how to reclaim this space in our cities. Um, naturally, when you do that, that existing building stock, which is usually pretty stout, um, pretty great construction from a long time ago, um, has tremendous potential for all sorts of uses today. So what makes a good property or a good building for adaptive reuse? It seems some buildings uh, are better than others, right? Absolutely. Um, I think one thing you have to do is you really have to do your homework on these projects. You really have to do um, a little bit of forensics, get in there and, and find out what these buildings were, what their life was, and, um, and what the existing condition is. There's all sorts of implications. You can have um, environmental issues, um, say if it was part of an industrial process. Um, structurally, you want to check those out and, and mesh that with probably future use and what sort of occupancy you're going to put in there. Um, there's all sorts of issues. And also, um, a lot of times these projects have tremendous um, uh, connectivity with what's going on in a city. So. Uh, these reclaimed corridors that I was talking about earlier with uh, with uh, the urban fabric can be something that's that's a tremendous asset to the city. But again, you really want to know what you're getting into, understand sort of what the actual base building is and what it's capable of before you try and start one of these projects. Yeah, and it's uh, some of that history is really what makes these projects so impactful, right? I mean, it's yeah. like the millennials and I guess everyone likes to be in cool space. Absolutely, and there's this. It's always been there with placemaking, but this notion of authenticity and sort of a history, a real patina that um, you can't you can't design, you can't make. I mean, we people try and faux that every now and then, right. and um, it always comes off uh, pretty insincere. And I think people, whether they know it or not, are very good judges of that, and they they see right through it. So. I think some of these older projects bring something that you just can't make, right? You can't make history in a passage of time. Right. And what about the municipalities where these projects are located? Is, is, are do, do most of them like seeing these buildings redeveloped and are they helpful when it comes to um, getting permits and, and getting approvals? Yeah, yeah, depending on where they are, I think in general cities love to see these projects kind of reclaimed. Um, there can be all sorts of incentive-based uh, things, everything from, from taxes to accelerated permitting to um, when you get into brownfield sites, there can be all sorts of federal credits with that. So I think, again, it's something you want to research on the front end. I don't think that's the reason to do it, but usually there's tremendous support for these projects because of, again, these are blighted areas usually or forgotten buildings. And, and uh, it, when you think about the urban fabric, if you can bring one of those buildings back to life, that's a whole new thriving part of the city plus tax base for 
wherever it happens to be. So are you seeing the entitlements maybe being a little easier uh, than a new project? I mean, because some of these older buildings, you know, have some issues you have to work through, like maybe parking and step yeah. backs and those sorts of things. Right? Yeah, and, and that's yeah. Uh, true for just about everywhere yeah. um, in the United States. Yeah. When you get into these industrial quarters, they weren't heavily parked. You didn't have the high population. A lot of times they were storage or warehouse. So um, it's just something that wasn't built into the project to begin with. So when you start to address that and work with uh, the city, sometimes there's different strategies, whether that's scale jumping and trying to borrow from other projects, um, a larger look at a project where you start thinking uh, of a cluster of projects and how you could accomplish parking and other issues, um, you know, whether that's power plant or the building, um, you know, wastewater, the, the whole thing. So, What about the team you'd want to put together for an adaptive reuse project compared to a new construction deal? Um, I think, you know, if, if you're using the right design team, it's probably the same. Again, the, the front end and when you really go in and analyze the project, that's probably the most important part to that. There are some times when um, you can get a, a jump on a project by bringing in, there's a lot of new technology now, laser scanning and some other things where guys can come in and a couple of days develop a point cloud for you that as an architect and as a design team, when you sit down to take a look at things and start actually designing, you get a very high res look at the project and you know everything is where it is. It, sometimes you know you get these sets of drawings which are, are magnificent, you know, they're the old pen, uh, you know, sort of quill drawings on linen because maybe this project was done in the early 1900s. Um, it's been through a lot over its lifetime, so you never quite know how many additions were done, how many were documented. So uh, things like that, specialty pieces like that are, are useful when you sit down to actually work with one of these projects, knowing the existing condition, basically. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I remember when I was a young broker and I had an older building that I thought was fantastic and had the best uh, investor to go into this deal, and his construction uh, team came in and said, oh, tear this thing down. This is <laughs> awful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I ended up selling it to someone else who did very well with it. So, yeah. I mean, you certainly can get some advisors who, who are just not not used to adaptive reuse, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and some some of the buildings are very are very stout, but maybe you're switching use. Like uh, even our office in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, we had a parking deck that was the first three levels of our building, and we decided to convert the the third level, which was at Peachtree, to a museum. It was a parking deck before, but we actually found out we needed because of the assembly requirement of a museum, we actually had to reinforce the structure at the at the ground level, which. We never thought of because we were just thinking, well, there was cars in there before. Certainly, it can handle, you know, a Smart. design museum, <laughs> right? right? Um, right. But uh, the, you know, the way that assembly uh, works and occupancy works, um, the loading was slightly higher, so we had to go in and retrofit a little bit. So. Well, that's interesting that you'd even think about turning a parking deck <laughs> into <laughs> yeah. a studio. Yeah, uh, I, that's that's the best part about these projects yeah. is um, there's things embedded in these projects that mm -hmm. you typically just wouldn't do. Um, other projects where there's been an industrial system, right, and it might have an incredible, uh, you know, network of structure that was really about a process or engineering associated with that, that building in its prior use. And those become sort of these follies or anomalies in a project that you would never build, but become kind of the, the playground and the sense of history when people start to use it. You see that all over uh, these large warehouse conversions or industrial conversions. Yeah. Well, what are some of the challenges of the architecture and, and design uh, part of a project when you are incorporating these old features? Well, a lot of it, again, is research and figuring out what you can use, what you can't use. Um, sometimes you get in and, like, like you, your example earlier, you think, oh, yeah, we can use this for, for, for this, that, and the other. You get in there and really do some analysis and get the engineering uh, reports back and figure out, well, that's got to come out. You can't really use it. Yeah. Um, other things uh, we've run into in the past uh, are, again, you know, abatement issues, anything with contaminants either in the soil or on the site, but also, um, you know, we went through some pretty nasty periods with asbestos and other things, which can be very expensive if you, um, if you overlook them. Right. So I guess that's a big part of your team in adaptive reuse is having the right environmental people and the right environmental lawyer, too, that's, that's yeah. familiar with that and yeah. that doesn't scare them off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You want, 
You want to know your uh, your pathway to a clean bill of health before you yeah. start. You don't want to you don't want to start doing that research after you're into the project. Right. Where one environmental uh, engineer and, and attorney may say, just walk away, don't get involved, <laughs> and another one might start wringing his hands yeah. and say, look, there's opportunity here, yeah. right? Yeah, and I will say it's gotten a lot easier. There's a lot of new mm -hmm. strategies that um, that are that are um, that are very conscientious. You know, whether that's um, dealing with uh, issues on site. Um, it's not always the, the case that it was before where everything is handled as if you know, you've got toxic waste on your hand and, and, and it was almost uh, to, the, to the end of the spectrum which made a lot of these projects just uh, financially uh, not feasible. So. Right, right. Well good point. We'll take a short break. We're going to have more on adaptive reuse. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Stay with us. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by CCIM Institute, commercial real estate's global standard for professional achievement. Visit ccim.com slash CRE show. That's ccim.com slash CRE show. Welcome back. I'm Michael Ball. You're listening to the Commercial Real Estate Show, or maybe you're watching. We're talking about adaptive reuse with Bruce McAvoy with Perkins Will. And Bruce, what advice would you give to people who are considering their first adaptive reuse project? Well, um, first, Michael, maybe they want to hire Perkins Will <laughs> yeah, to work go. with them. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, I think... And Bull Realty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, I think... Uh, the best advice I could I could give anybody for these types of projects are, are look for the projects that are the timing is right and that the project the actual building is right as well. So again, that goes back to the research, but also I think you can really look into a city, um, sort of see the fabric, see where it's growing, and these um, some and then there's kind of two types of these projects. The way I think of it is sometimes it's these industrial corridors where the building is much much older. Uh, but that's part of the city is either going through a transformation or has been left to kind of sit for a while. But there's also another type of adaptive reuse, you know, which is these uh, 80s office buildings that are kind of, you know, have fallen down through the tiers of, uh, of different sort of ratings and, and they're kind of forgotten buildings in the urban fabric. Um, those buildings are extremely valuable in the sense uh, if you can get in there and figure out again what's inside the building, what you have to deal with when you get there. That's a that's a nice sort of jump start to a project. Right. That's a good point. And, and you guys did that recently uh, with a building. And uh, you know, it's interesting though. Sometimes see, people see an '80s office building, and but you guys, you know, what could you do with that thing? Uh, yeah. But you guys had the vision. Yeah. Uh, well, again, going back to the bones of the project, which is usually where I start. Um, mm -hmm. The the building you're referencing is in Atlanta, and that project was fantastic. It had a a column free space, a 64 foot free span done by a, a, a talented architect here in Atlanta. Um, and we came in and basically tore it down to its bones and, and kind of redid the whole thing. Um, it, it ended up being uh, one of the highest rated lead platinum buildings in the world when it was finished. Nice. Um, and really, uh, you know, it had a, an existing library in it, which we kept, and we closed down sort of the base, which was, uh, you know, the the, trend, the urban condition around the building had completely changed. It had sort of a, a very residential horseshoe driveway, and on Peachtree Street was, uh, was basically parking. So in closing that and turning that into retail, or in this case, uh, it ended up being the Museum of Design Atlanta, um, really contributed back to the urban fabric and, and something that probably wasn't quite there in 86 when that building was done. Right. So um, a lot of it, a lot of this is timing too. Um, yeah. You know, some buildings are just ready. Right. Well, I think a lot of people have found out the, you know, the saying is the most important thing in real estate is location, location, location. But yeah. I think a lot of people have found out timing, 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 timing. timing is also yeah. very important. Completely agree. And how did you find the end users uh, appeal towards your projects and the other projects you, you worked on? Are the, yeah. are the tenants, the users, the occupiers, uh, what do they think of these projects? Well, I think there's, um, there's a real authenticity and sort of, a, again, a patina to, to these projects. There's a, there's a tangible sense of history in these projects. Um, we, don't, we don't build the way that a lot of these projects were built if it's one of the older projects or turn of the century projects. Uh, there's just an incredible, uh, incredible sense of of, uh, of history there as you walk through these projects, and I think 
The people who do this well and what we try and do is add to that history. We try and layer on an architecture as opposed to sometimes you see these projects and it almost seems a little a little uh, molested or tortured when you go into it because everything they try and encapsulate everything and, and make a new building inside these things. One of the best assets and coolest parts about these projects really is that it's an old building and that's the part to be celebrated. You know, you can dial down the the design intensity of everything else and really um, celebrate this new use that's going on in an old factory, an old power plant, um, you know, an old, an old ferry terminal. Mm -hmm. What do you say to clients who are interested in adaptive reuse but they're a little afraid of the unknowns and sometimes you know, getting estimates of what this final project is going to cost seems a little difficult to them? Yeah, um, most of it on the front end again is that, that analysis of what you're getting into but there are going to be little things that come up um, I think you have to have a little bit of flexibility. We like to have a healthy contingency when we go into these projects, just for those unknowns. I mean, you start peeling back layers of time and you never know what you have in there. Um, sometimes it might be a treasure, sometimes it's something you gotta deal with, so. Right. Yeah, you, you move this wall and you find out you've got <laughs> something to deal with, so that's good advice. It's uh, like restoring an old car, right? right? You clean it too much, it yeah. might fall apart, <laughs> yeah. so. Yeah, I have a good reserve number. Yeah. And you mentioned the, the ferry project, right, that you guys yeah. are involved in in San Francisco. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, Perkins & Will um, kind of repurposed and repositioned the ferry terminal, and that's just one of these projects that, again, a huge piece of infrastructure sitting there, great old building, and basically brought it back to life, and now it's a thriving part of, of San Francisco. Francisco and and really that was just the idea again of going in and and embracing sort of the strengths of that old project and just giving it the attention it needed to kind of live again under a new purpose. And now, what is the purpose now? It's it's a thriving mixed use uh, ferry terminal now. So it basically you you go into it. It's a it's a great place to shop to eat. There's restaurants. Um, it's fantastic. So. How was the, the lease up on a project like that? Did uh, people, I know San Francisco is just a really hot market anyway, but were the tenants kind of clamoring to get in there? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, again, the, the uniqueness of these projects is the other asset, I think, when you're done with them. Um, you know, you can go into sort of generic construction or, or new construction, but then you're competing against every other new project that's coming to market with it. Um, these adaptive reuse projects have an inherent um, sort of cool factor to them that I think um, is becoming more and more popular. Again, because of the uniqueness, you can't you can't really uh, compete with that as a new project. If somebody if that's what they want to do and where they're they're going, these anomalies and and uh, and sort of quirks of these projects actually become their value. Right. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, it has an identity, right? I know yeah. a lot of new projects. You know, you're hiring a PR firm. You're trying to yeah. create a a sense of, of place uh, from from scratch. Well, if you can say, well, it's the, it's the old ferry terminal. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you've already, they already know. It already has a story. You're adding yeah. to it. So yeah. the richness of history there and what you, can, um, what you can do with that as opposed to sort of a manufactured brand that you're, that you're kind of uh, trying to bring to market with, uh, with, that's only looking forward. Uh, these projects can look back as well. Yeah. Are you seeing a lot more vel velocity in your industry of adaptive reuse? I think so. I think um, I think the timing is right. Um, the market's good again. There seems to be a real um, across whether it's mixed use projects or office. You know, we saw the emergence of creative office um, in the last decade as well, where you know you saw major companies decide I don't want to go into a tower. I don't want to be in class off a uh, class A office space. I'd rather have you know an old power plant. I'd rather have a warehouse, and I'd rather take take down 75,000 square feet on a single floor as opposed to the traditional 25. Um, and, and that's just a choice, I think, again, of this, this tangible, uh, authentic uh, sort of reuse environment that has, has a little bit more grit to it maybe than the polished uh, Class A office space. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I looked at a building just driving down the street in Athens where uh, UGA is uh, last weekend and I'm yeah. looking at these couple of these old buildings like man that'd be great but it's just sitting there empty so let's I guess all it. of us are thinking about it more right just, yeah let's do it let's it's probably use. probably uh, probably ready but then you look at the challenges too it has little to no parking and uh, you've got to work through a lot of that yep uh, so that's great well Bruce thanks for joining us here in Studio yeah. One today we appreciate it Appreciate it. Yeah. Great to be here. Thanks, Michael. Well, great. Well, stay tuned. We're going to have more on adaptive reuse. Um, we're going to talk to a developer that's been involved in several projects, and we'll hear from him about some of the, the ups and downs and things to watch out for in adaptive reuse. Remember to like us on 
Facebook and connect with us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter. We would like to hear from you. Visit our website, commercialrealestateshow.com. Stay tuned. More adaptive reuse right after this message. I'm Michael Bull. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Bull Realty, commercial real estate asset and occupancy solutions. Visit bullrealty.com. CCIM Institute, commercial real estate's global standard for professional achievement. Visit ccim.com slash CRE show. Excelligent, providing verified commercial real estate information across the United States. Visit excelligent.com.